really delighted to have like a big lecture every term. Last term we had Matthew Connolly, who was the director of CSER, is the director of CSER currently, which is the Center for the Study of Existential Risk. Um, on Tuesday, we also had a really uh, lovely talk with Yuval Noah Harari, and um, some of our fellows got to speak with him on stage, which was great. So uh, yeah, we are really excited to be hosting this lecture. Um, and this lecture is with our very own Demetrius Flotus. So he is an adjunct professor at the law faculty of Immanuel Kant Baltic Federal University in Kaliningrad and fellow of the Hellenic Institute of Foreign and International Law. He is an international lawyer and regulatory advisor who has lived and worked in Russia and Ukraine for a decade, advising the Ministry of Economic Development and Trade and the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service. He served as team leader for the Russian accession to the World Trade Organization and was for several years visiting professor at the Moscow State Institute for International Relations. In a series of lectures at Hughes Hall, he has for many years predicted that an armed conflict in Ukraine was becoming increasingly plausible. In addition, Dimitrius Flautis has provided commentary on matters of foreign affairs and international relations to a number of international think tanks, with his views frequently appearing in the media worldwide, such as the BBC, Voice of America, Financial Times, Daily Telegraph, Washington Post, Politico, and others, including media in Russia and Ukraine. He is senior advisor to the Cambridge Existential Risk Initiative, and we are delighted to have him speak tonight. So without further ado, please, Professor Cloudus. First of all, many thanks to Olivia and uh, Kerry for organizing this for us. Second, apologies from me as well for this little mix-up that happened. This was for, from some miscommunication within the college, I understand. But there's more than a silver lining in that miscommunication. It's a golden lining. I always was dreaming of having a lecture in the old library of Emma, which is one of the most eminent and amazing rooms in Cambridge. In fact, the, if the Queen's Lecture Theatre is just a, a you know, kind of Swedish, uh, no, uh, Scandinavian, Ikea kind of setup, a lecture on theatre, and now we are in the august walls of this. So once again, sorry for the delay in starting and for keeping a, a few of you outside while we were trying to get the, uh, you know, the, the sound and uh, the picture working but I hope that we will compensate. There is going to be discussion. I intend to speak for 55 minutes or one hour. Then there's going to be questions and answers and discussion. Please be as uh, energetic as you want in that. And afterwards there is a wide reception. So without further ado, this, these are the contents of I should not be in front of that. These are the contents of what we are going to touch upon today. And this lecture is everything you wanted to know about nuclear warfare. I wish if I had two days and it was a seminar that uh, was lasting 16 hours, eight hours a day, I, we would have been able to cover everything that you probably wanted to know, and certainly not all. What we are going to talk about is strategy, Russian doctrine, delivery systems, and scenarios for Ukraine, what may possibly happen. Plus, we are getting a bonus of exploding four myths about nuclear uh, strategy, which may surprise you. And, of course, we have the questions and answers after that. We are not going to talk about the history of atomic weapons, certainly not the physics or the types of weapons, the results of their blasts, nuclear proliferation, nuclear control or nuclear treaties. Are you aware of the Doomsday Clock? This is from the, the Union of Atomic Scientists and they have the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. And they have it for 75 years, they have the doomsday clock. How close we are to 
the extinguishment of mankind. This moved in January 2023 to 90 seconds to midnight. Midnight is the end. And this was the closest it has ever moved. And that means that we are really in an existential risk situation. And if we do not understand that, then that is also a big problem. I was lucky enough to be uh, amongst those who attended Yuval Harari's lecture earlier this week. Uh, he came to visit the university and he started his presentation by saying that February, it is very probable that February 2022 will be perceived in nobody knows how many years from now, could be five, could be 50, as the beginning of the Third World War, the same way that we perceive 1st of September 1939 as the beginning of the Second World War. This, coming so close to my own presentation, certainly made it even more clear to me that it is not a minority of us that think this way. If someone as important as Harari is, uh, has this opinion, it means that we, are, we really should be careful. There we go. Have you noticed the date? This is a leap date. And I have to admit that it was very much on purpose that it was chosen. We were very lucky that Emmanuel College had the opportunity to give it to us on this day. This day has been considered unlucky ever since Roman times. In fact, it was a dies nefastus. A nefastus is the root of where our word nefarious comes from. So, an unlucky day, and I think very appropriate to have it this particular lecture. Let's start now with very few numbers. This, these are the warhead numbers from 1945, on the left, where the first uh, nuclear weapons were used, up to 2021, where the statistics end. As you can see, these are, this is total warhead numbers. As you can see, the maximum is in 1985, also 1983, that we will talk about in a few, in 10 minutes or so. You can see that this is the peak. After 1985, with Gorbachev and Glasnost and Perestroika and the rapprochement between the two sites, they start to decline and they decline much more, as you see, steepest during the 90s when, of course, Ru the Soviet Union has broken up and things are quite negative for them. This graph in particular shows with blue the US nuclear warheads number and with red the Soviet nuclear warheads number. Again, the peak is in the 80s, mostly because as you can see, the Soviets have twice the number of warheads that the United States has. And after that, again, during the 90s, you see this sharp fall both in the United States and Russia. So as we go here, the line becomes parallel. They are more or less the same now than as they were in 2014. What do I mean by more or less the same? It's, it's all right there. This is the total number of nuclear warheads as we speak. I believe it's January 24, in fact. Russia has almost 6,000. NATO has almost 6,000. The whole of NATO, that includes Britain, France and the United States. And the, the other powers, nuclear powers, as you can see, are quite insignificant in comparison to that in numbers, but that does not 
mean that they are any less deadly than nuclear weapons. You don't need that many thousands, so it doesn't would be enough to create unthinkable damage. And of course we have the latest one, North Korea, with about 20. Some of these are, as you can understand, estimates. Now, NATO against Russia in particular now, January 24. ICBMs, Russia has far more. Submarine, it's NATO that has the lead, significant. Aircraft bombers, uh, again, NATO has more. Tactical weapons is this non-strategic and defensive forces. And as you can perceive, the, the lead, the supremacy of Russia in tactical weapons is without any doubt. What is nuclear strategy? That's the title of the lecture, nuclear strategy in the Ukraine war era. Let's define, let's be academic about it and define nuclear strategy. Nuclear strategy, as you can see, is the formation of tenets and principles for producing and using nuclear weapons. So we get, we take into account the tactical and operational choices uh, with the respect not only of the use but also to the threat of nuclear weapons. Because strategy of course expands to many areas, very much so in the military, but as you will see now, nuclear strategy is so complicated at times as to be the realm of the few very clever and it takes a lot of reading and understanding in order to wrap your head around the intricacies, some of the intricacies of nuclear strategy. So what we try to do, what every nuclear country that we saw before is trying to do, is a deterrent effect. That's they do not have, they do not have a nuclear program to create nuclear weapons. So as soon as they have them, we're going to drop them on the enemy. We want the enemy to, to prevent the enemy from attacking us. So the deterrent effect is the objective of nuclear strategy. What is nuclear doctrine? The nuclear doctrine is, it's a, a smaller, me area of meaning um, than strategy, it is part of nuclear strategy, and the doctrine refers to an individual nuclear state. So there is the Russian nuclear doctrine, the United States, the British, and so on. These are the goals and missions that guide the deployment and use for each weapon state. So that would include the fourth structure. What is our doctrine? What is the British nuclear doctrine? It is submarines, ballistic submarines only. No bombers, no ICBMs. Britain used to have all these, but it has decided to abolish the triad, as it is called, which includes the bombers and the uh, ICBMs, the intercontinental strategic missiles, and has only submarines. Or you may have tactical only. North uh, Israel is believed to have only tactical nuclear weapons. The reason for that is that A, they don't want something as massive as which would destroy the whole of the Middle East. Number two, their enemies that they would be used again are, against are quite close. They are not on another continent. Declaratory policy is, the, is a doctrine part of the nuclear doctrine. What do we mean by declaratory policy? For example, a no first use policy as part of a state's nuclear doctrine exists already in two, clearly in two of the nuclear armed states that exist. China and India are the only ones that have an open no first use policy. <coughs> All the others 
uh, either say we may use them or they are within creative ambiguity, that kind of situation. And of course nuclear related diplomacy falls under the nuclear doctrine as we had in the Cuban Missile Crisis. What do we mean by posture then? The posture is, this originated from uh, a document that every few years was coming out in the United States called the US Nuclear Posture Review. Now, this, even though it started nuclear posture was the US nuclear posture, now the use of the term has expanded uh, to summarize and interpret the nuclear strategy of any nuclear state. So, one of the very first, I'm sure you have heard about this, one of the very first tenets of nuclear strategy was the so-called MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction, because we had two superpowers armed to the teeth. You saw how many the, the warheads were during the 1980s, and that meant that whoever attacked would be met with an overwhelming response so both sides would be annihilated, the end of the, the world. Now this is partly true and in fact it was a nuclear strategy, a real nuclear strategy for part of the Cold War, but this is only sub the superficial top side of nuclear strategy. There's much more, many more considerations beneath it before we reach mutual assured destruction. And we will see now. Mutual, uh, there is the unacceptable damage doctrine, which means that deterrence would work in the event that an enemy would not attack us who have nuclear weapons, because we would be able to inflict on the adversary unacceptable damage. The definition for that was 25% of the population and 50% of the industry. If you have two countries, two opponents, that can inflict unacceptable damage to each other, then we have a stable and equilibrium situation. <coughs> During the Cold War, we had another tenet which is called launch on warning. I can't think of the number of Hollywood's movies that have actually exploited this particular part of strategy in their own scenarios. Anything that, that you can think of, from War Games to Terminator 3, and I was trying to think of as many as I could, and I came up with at least 20, and that was just the tip of the iceberg. What's launch on warning? The usual that you see in the film. Oh, uh, Colonel, there is, we have been notified, uh, there is from our radar shows that there's a missile coming from the Soviet Union. What do we do? Do we strike back? The principle behind it was launch on warning. You were not waiting to be hit during the Cold War. Any kind of warning which was given by radars, or satellites, um, other communication varieties like that would have been enough. So as soon as you have that, you launch. Now, launch on warning has one very serious advantage and one very serious disadvantage. The advantage is that if you launch on warning, you avoid being having your own weapons being destroyed on the ground by the enemy. On the other hand, it may well happen that there is some kind of error, mistake, miscommunication, or any other things, things that can happen in human situations. And of course, that would mean annihilation, because if you start a lot of warning on, uh, on a false alarm, the other side, which also abides by launch of war on warning, is going to do exactly the same, and then we have the end once again. Massive retaliation is a doctrine uh, applicable 
to you, the USA in particular, during the 50s. It was the doctrine whereby um, there would be a massive nuclear retaliation against the communist states, which were not as well armed. They had far fewer nuclear warheads in the 50s than the West did. As even during a conventional attack at, in the periphery. Of course, that meant that the United States would not be utilizing conventional weapons. And of course, it meant that it started spending less in conventional weaponry, which was bringing us, bringing the US, in a fix whereby if, let's say, there was going to be an attack against Japan, for example, by either Soviet Union or China, then the, Floyd, the, face would, the choice would be, as it says here, between suicide, massive retaliation, they will retaliate back, or surrender, say, well, we're not going to destroy the planet, take it. So, this, in the 60s, was definitely superseded. Now, the concept of limited nuclear war appeared in the 70s, and its definition is a war, a nuclear war, where each side exercises restraints. This may sound lovely to you, because of course we have been brought up with these nuclear war films where there is no dis restraint at all, launch of warning or missiles go, whether and damn the torpedoes. Well, in this situation, you have a much more flexible possibility to respond than if you have, uh, if you decide to do a massive retaliation. And you are going to attack the, uh, in particular, the forces, the military forces, ideally the nuclear ones, of your adversary. However, in order to do this, you need to have a kind of unspoken mutual understanding. So, we can have a war, but it will be a limited war, a nuclear war, I mean. It will be a limited nuclear war. We are just going to shoot at each other's military. Well, to the extent that this is possible, and at some point, one side or both decide not to abide by it, and then the end comes near. But still, limited war is still a concept and definitely exists in nuclear strategy considerations, even as we speak today. Counterforce, something that you need to know. It means essentially it's the doctrine whereby you shoot against the enemy's military structure, infrastructure only. And this is part of the limited war that we were talking just before. If we have a counterforce only, a counterforce doctrine applicable to both adversaries, then once they have exhausted their nuclear strikes against any military infrastructure that is worth it to be shot at, that would bring an end to the conflict. Of course, this presupposes again that the adversaries would agree, as before, limited nuclear war, to restrict, to restrict their targeting against military infrastructure. And, of course, the logic that lies behind that is that any country would be able to absorb the initial attack and still have enough power to respond to the adversary. What happens if you do not, however, want to use counterforce? Well, the other side of the coin is called countervalue. And the countervalue doctrine is again what we understand and we see both from history and the films. You drop a bomb on a city, whether that would be Hiroshima and Nagasaki back in 1945 or in 
everything that we've been seeing, that would be Washington, New York, Moscow, Leningrad, and London and Paris. How does counter value, however, work in reality? As we said, all nuclear powered, nu uh, nuclear armed states started to move towards a counter force doctrine and the idea was that they would keep this gentleman's agreement, the unspoken uh, agreements. If you threaten, how would they keep it? They would keep it, the war prescribed within counter force by threatening counter value. If you start playing not by the rules of our unspoken agreements, then we are going to use counter value against you. Now, counter value targeting means that we have to have an effective deterrent remaining. Only if both sides have a secure second strike capability. And we are going to examine what this means right now. Second strike capability is when I, as a nuclear state, have the ability to be struck by a nuclear attack from the enemy, absorb it, and then be able to strike back with nuclear weapons that will do massive damage to the enemy. So, first strike I have absorbed, and then my second strike is my retaliation. That is the second strike capability. This explains the huge number that we saw in the 70s and 80s of nuclear weapons because they were there in order to ensure second strike capability for both sides. There were so many and dispersed and hidden underground and on planes that were constantly on the air taking shifts and all that, that enough would remain, and of course, I forget submarines, that's the whole point, submarines uh, were thought, and still are, thought to be invulnerable. So whatever happens, we will be able to have the second strike capability, and this is enough to prevent the enemy from attacking us, ergo nuclear deterrence. Now, the second strike doctrine, of course, was criticized, and has been criticized by the experts, because it means that well, you know, the first strike and then your second strike are still going to destroy the world. So that is effectively the same like neutral assured destruction. Now, that means that if you are a new nuclear power, and let's say you're South, you're North Korea, and imagine yourself as the Secretary General of the party of North Korea, and you want your country to become invulnerable, attack. Does North Korea now have second strike capability? The answer is pr no. It has only about 20 warheads, we estimate, and we more or less know or can suppose where they can be so that we can, with a first strike, we would be able to take them out all or, even if not all, the one or two remaining are not much of a big deal if they hit us back with us, or with us. So, the first stage that a new nuclear power reaches after being a youngling is to reach second strike capability. It means that I have, as I said, enough nuclear warheads and dispersed and utilized in such a way that there is no way that any first strike would take them out. Or a significant number for retaliation would remember. But let's take this second strike to its natural conclusion. Very counterintuitively, what happens if you become even bigger, even more threatening, and even more belligerent and scary, from second strike capability is first strike capability. First strike capability comes after 
in the evolution ladder from second strike because it means that your nuclear weaponry, your arsenal, has become so large and so effective that you can wipe out the enemy and the enemy doesn't have, will not have, second strike capability any longer. So you, that is when a nation achieves first strike capability, we have a very unstable situation. Stability comes if we have adversaries coming, being at the second strike capability stage. If one or both reach first strike capability, then the equilibrium is inherently unstable. First strike capability has actually appeared historically once. For the ones of you who are of more than uh, the age of our students here, you will remember back in the 80s, and 80s in particular, that the Soviet Union had come up with some amazing, really unsurpassable ICBMs that could be used to actually to give first strike capability to the Soviet Union. Their ICBMs were so big, had so many warheads in them, and they were also hidden in the vast plains, the taiga of Siberia, that if they were launched all together, they would obliterate NATO and the continental United States without be NATO and the West having the opportunity to give a second strike. So, for a few years, it appears that the Soviet Union did have first strike capability. Inherently unstable, as we said. A current doctrine is called flexible response. Flexible response is exactly what is happening now in Ukraine. This is a strategy where you do not just use, okay, uh, the enemy has, has attacked one of our allies or ourselves, let's drop a bomb on them. No, you utilize a whole lot of different measures at different levels, whether that would be diplomatic, political, sanctions, economic, and military measures at the same time, so you remain ambiguous about how far you're going to go, slightly ambiguous about where your red lines are, and you utilize the whole spectrum according to the perception of threat. Something else that you will find quite interesting, the physicists amongst you will know that really well. For the rest of you, an electromagnetic pulse attack simplified is essentially one single big detonation very high up in the atmosphere. Could be from 40 kilometers up to 300, 400 kilometers from the surface. The higher it explodes, the bigger that the radius it affects is. What happens is that we have prompt radiation, gamma rays <laughs> from the detonation, and when these gamma rays, extremely energetic, hit the atmosphere, the molecules become ionized and start producing electromagnetic waves, very strong electromagnetic waves. So, any system which within the line of sight of the explosion will sustain damage. The electromagnetic pulse has three stages. One is the near instantaneous pulse that happens exactly at the moment, the microsecond of the nuclear explosion, and that causes most of its damage by including voltage in any 
thing electrical, so it would blow its fuses immediately, or if it doesn't have fuses, it may explode or just burn. The second, the E2, as we call it, is a high amplitude pulse. This behaves a little bit like a lightning strike. Let's say that you know, you're, sometimes your TV antenna is, uh, or your, uh, your air conditioning part, which is outside, gets struck by lightning. It doesn't even have to be directly. If it strikes one part of your house, it may actually go through there. They, if you have uh, some protection against lightning, then you can manage to get away with it. The problem is that most protection from lightning would have been degraded by E1. So E2 becomes catastrophic as well. And then comes E3. And E3 lasts from several seconds to several minutes, depending on how high up the EMP has taken place. And that actually follows the electromagnetic field of the Earth. So, amongst other things, I'm told that you will have a very fascinating aurora happening. But I guess that there will not be that many around of us remaining, or certainly interested enough in these, because they would be far too interested to actually survive. What would happen is that these long E3 would actually use any long conductor, such as long range the cables and telecommunication lines, and again induce massive uh, charges on them, which will destroy essentially whatever remains of E1 and E2. Don't think that this is a kind of humane way of doing nuclear war, think of a situation whereby, because of the strike, all the cars will actually stop working, because they have electric systems and they have wires, so people would be speeding at 100 kilometers an hour and suddenly the cars, the bus, will just uh, stop responding. Uh, people who would be receiving uh, operations in hospitals or other treatment, suddenly everything would go black. There would be uh, panic, as you can imagine, in complete darkness if it happens at night, and fires would start, many fires, because as I said, many systems would simply explode from E1 and E2, and, and they would start fires that would be impossible to actually put out because the fire engines would not be able to be used any longer. So even there are, though there are no direct, uh, there are no victims from the blast, EMP can be a very strong deterrent. Now one thing that we should hear about Mirrors, multiple independent re-entry vehicles. These are real Russian mirrors. It used to be that every one of these ICBMs had one nuclear bomb at the end, so we would launch it, it would go ballistically fly 10,000 kilometers, drop on the enemy, boom. But we became much better at it, and what we did was to actually put multiple little warheads. So at some point during its trajectory, the ICBM, the, the cover, the cap, comes out, and the bus, that's the bus, starts shooting the individual nerves. These can go at different speeds and completely different trajectories. They don't need to go parallel at all. You can imagine that A, on one hand, this creates a much bigger force of strike, and number two, 
even if you have some kind of anti-ballistic capability, it becomes impossible to defend against. So, just to give you an example, in the 60s where MIRS did not exist, there was a mutually assured destruction because if one country targeted the silos, the ICBMs of the other, the kill ratio would be less than one. So for 1,000 missiles that we launch, we will destroy 500 of the enemies and then the enemy with the other 500 is going to launch them against us and it, that is still bad enough. However, if you have mirrors, the kill ratio could actually greatly exceed one. If you have 1,000 of the enemy, you actually shoot 100 of yours, 900 still remain, you destroy 50, or you destroy 900 of the enemy, so suddenly you have one country that still has 900, and the enemy has 100. And at that point, you, do you pick up the red phone and you say, do you really want to continue this? What do you think the answer is going to be? Just to give you an example, we're not going to dwell on this. This, and for the ones of you who have studied Nash diagrams and equilibrium, this is an example of applied strategy, nuclear strategy, during the Cold War, it has a lot of deeper information which we're not going to cover, as in preclusive first strike capability, secure second strike and all that, but just to give you an example, that nuclear strategy, as I was saying at the beginning, is not the easiest way. Following up on this, the prisoner's dilemma as a, an opportunity to, uh, to use it on heavy arms race. What was happening during the two superpowers was like an ongoing prisoner's dilemma, not a one-off. Cooperating, which means that we are not going to attack you and we will stop creating more and more nuclear weapons, would be great. Defecting means that let's rearm more and more and let's build far more nuclear warheads than the enemy. Of course, we know from Prisoner's Dilemma that the dominant strategy is usually defect, as in, let's go in an arms race. Even though we know that the best possible outcome is cooperation for both. But in order to assure cooperation, you need to be able to do, to have information about this. And obviously, these are two secrets. Finally, tactical nuclear weapons, because that's what we are going to be talking from uh, from now on. Tactical, until now, nuclear strategy was mostly about strategic nuclear weapons. Tacticals are the ones that typically have a range of less than 500 kilometers, and they have a yield of less than 50 kilotons. There are no exact limits, but I can tell you that tactical nuclear weapons are included in absolutely anything that you can imagine. There's even anti-aircraft missiles against aircraft formations which are nuclear. There, is, there are anti-ballistic missiles which are nuclear. Landmines, landmines that a big formation goes over and the landmine is nuclear, deck charges, torpedoes. So all these are tactical. And as we saw, Russia has the largest inventory of tactical weaponry. Now, Russian nuclear posture. This is what President Putin uh, said, announced in his television interview on the first day of the war, back in February 22. What is the nuclear rush, the Russian nuclear doctrine? Well, we know it. They have been talking about this, and we have been observing it for years. In 1993, their doctrine, they publicized this document. All countries do. Most nuclear countries do. The Soviet ones. 
they said that we would allow first use, remember only two countries have given up first use, we would use first if there was a threat to the existence of the Russian Federation. In the year 2000, this changed the existence of the Russian Federation into this wording. Large-scale aggression utilizing conventional weapons in situations critical to the national security of the Russian Federation. So, as far as any of you can understand, the threshold has gone down. This is, it's not very clear, I'll, give you, I'll show you another slide, but this is the escalation management model under Russian doctrine. Starting, I'll use the other slide, starting from a local war, which is what we have now, and what is their doctrine? Use of general purpose forces, check. Use of strategic conventional weapons, check. Threats to use nuclear weapons, check. Don't be surprised, it was all there in the report all along. Shouldn't surprise any of you. Regional war, let's say one against NATO, mass use of strategic conventional weapons, use of non strategic tactical nuclear weapons, demonstrative use of strategic, and then the last one, large scale nuclear war all out against NATO and the United States, which would actually fall under the strategy tenets that we explored in the first part of our seminar. Russia utilizes flexible response as well as NATO, as we saw before, and it's also a flexible response, by the way, as I said, is something that most countries, all countries now, which are nuclear armed, seem to abide by. Therefore, because of the flexible response, it is not a surprise to anyone who knew about Russian military and nuclear doctrine that there have been threats of use of nuclear weapons. It might have shocked the vast majority of the population, but in reality they are going by the book. And they have even told us what the book is. It's not classified information. So, it is a very well-known and well-established escalation doctrine. This is just a chain of commands to give you an idea. The authorization first codes would be given by the president, and then the president would use this check it, as it's known, the uh, equivalent of nuclear football, and would pass codes that he has coming in to the nuclear military command. The general staff then uses the codes to access other launch codes, and then these launch codes are transmitted to the ICBM silos, where with they are put together with the codes that these people have, the, the forces there who stand guard 24 hours a day have there, and they will use both these codes in order to effectuate the launch. Now, I promised you a little diversion for myths. And for these, I would like to ask for your co-participation, just for a few seconds. Your participation entails only raising your hands, but not being shy about it. So if it's yes, you raise your hands. If it's no, just you don't. So, first of all, the world came Closest to annihilation during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Who believes this is correct? One, two, three, four, five, six. Don't be shy, I just want to see. Who believes that the West would never use nuclear weapons first? Mm. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, zero. Third, who believes that Ukraine had atomic weapons which it willingly relinquished? Ah, okay. And then, SDI, so-called Star Wars, for the old-timers amongst uh, us. 
contributed to the fall of the Soviet Union. Great. Maybe. Let's look at each of them. First of all, the myth that 1962 was the closest shape. Have you ever, who has heard of this? The closest shape, well, uh, yes, uh, of course, uh, Professor Polonsky is a long time resident of Russia, that's why you would know about it. The closest shape ever appears, appears, and I will explain to you why, to have happened in November 1983. It was during a NATO exercise called Able Archer, and that exercise was had, had envisaged to raise the threat level to DEFCON 1. DEFCON 1 is nuclear war, actual nuclear war, not threat. But that was an exercise. Now, at the time, November 83, the situation was as bad as it could possibly be. We had Andropov, who was a very hardline Soviet Secretary General as Premier in the Soviet Union. There were very few uh, relations and I don't think Andropov had ever met with any European leaders, for example. So, massive mistrust. A couple of weeks before, the airplane, the Korean Airways 007 flight, had been shot down over Sakhalin with uh, three, 400 people in it by the Soviet Air Force. What, apropos of that, President Reagan of the US comes out and gives the famous Evil Empire speech. And we're in the middle of a rearmament, of massive rearmament, on behalf of NATO, who are, who are bringing the famous Pershing II and cruise missiles into Europe because Russia has utilized its own SS-18, codenamed, very appropriately, Satan. <laughs> this is the actual NATO program. So this is the closest we ever came. We know initially from defectors during the 90s and then through the opening of Soviet archives, uh, sorry, defectors during the 80s and then de in the 90s opening of archives that they had already put the nuclear weapons in, on the airplanes in Poland and Czechoslovakia and the codes had been broken and given and passed which means that they were live. So it was just a matter of flying over and pressing the button. The authorization had been given. That's what I mean by the codes have been broken up. This is then much closer than we ever came during Cuba. Two, NATO would not shoot first. At least none of you fell for this. Yes, we do. It's part of NATO's nuclear deterrence principles and it does fall under the flex and response. And not only now, but this was in fact a basic, a fundamental, I should say, military strategy of NATO during the 80s, remember when we saw the nuclear war, because there was no way that they could somehow fight, stop the Warsaw Pact forces from taking over Europe all over to the English Channel. All the war games had, were showing that the Warsaw Pact powers would be so overwhelming that only nuclear weapons, initially tactical, would stop them. Of course, they knew that initially tactical might eventually get out of hand and the end would be there. But, at least, we, none of you believes that NATO would never shoot first. It has been a strategy of NATO since the 70s. Now, nuclear Ukraine, I think that this is going to be very interesting for you. 
we have been listening and reading this truth for the last two years. Ukraine willingly gave up its nuclear weapons because it was told to, if they had not, now they would never have been under threat and Russia, of course, would never imagine anything like invading them. Wrong. Ukraine ended up with nuclear weapons on its territory, but there was someone else's nuclear weapons. The Ukrainian state, the new Ukrainian state at the time, had absolutely neither access, physical access, to these, nor would it ever be allowed access. It is very clear that there are always conventional forces around nuclear depots, and very strongly armed. It had become very clear that this was Russian property, and even if they somehow had managed to overpower, they would have ended up with a number of very heavy, several ton plutonium paperweights, because they don't, they would never have the codes. As you notice, permissive links they're called, there are several codes that need to be used. If you have a nuclear weapon here, and it's someone else, it's not yours, there is no way, no way, I wish we had a nuclear engineer here with us, or physicist, who would explain to you why, there is no way that you can explode it. You can make a dirty bomb, but you will never make a nuclear explosion. Amongst other things, if you try to tamper it, a small explosive will go off, small, so that it, it does not become a dirty bomb, but it will pulverize the so-called physics package, so you, instead of having a plutonium warhead, which might create a nuclear reaction, you're going to end up with a lot of plutonium dust. Quite useless for a nuclear weapon. So, that is the myth. They were always Russian, these weapons. And then, Star Wars, um, the SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative, brought down the Soviet Union. I think I told you before about nerds. I think I told you about, I even mentioned this. I love it. SS-18, Satan 1, deployed in 1978. Range 10,200 kilometers. It was so far advanced. Remember when I said first strike capability at the beginning? That's the first strike capability. It was so far advanced. It has such a huge throw weight, as we come, as we say. Throw weight is the payload in nuclear weapons. And it had a huge number of nerves. It would actually, Satan 1 would carry 10, 800 kilotons, almost a megaton, warheads plus 40 penetration devices. These are decoys. You remember we saw all these little uh, cones on the bus? There would be 50 of these. Now, even if you had, and Soviet scientists were not stupid, even if there was, they knew that there would never, ever be a possibility, at least in the next half century, even beyond now, some of these kind of lasers shooting from the sky. Well, what would you be shooting at? They would have, you would have so many penetration aids and decoys and so many additional mirrors that it would be completely pointless. So the countermeasure to SDI would have been much easier. It was a technology that already existed, had been tested, and about 1,000 times cheaper. So no SDI never brought down the USSR, and the USSR was not fooled. They knew it. They realized that it could never be of any threat to them. So, Doomsday Clock, as we said, is at 90 seconds to midnight, the closest it has ever been. Let's look at a few delivery systems as we go towards our close. This that you see behind is the largest bomb ever constructed, Soviet 100 megatons. These are the land-based missiles from Russia. This is SS-18, Satan-1, NATO name. This is SSX-30, Satan-2, 
the upgraded version, NATO name again. And you can see how far they can reach. 16,000 miles would actually it takes you to another planet, as you don't see. So there is not much of a way that they would not reach their target. There's a sea-based deterrent. In fact, this is the British sea-based deterrent that I'm using here to show you. Trident missiles and bombers, another part of the triad. To, uh, the Bear, Polish 95, radius 7, uh, almost 8,000 nautical miles. Think about it, 8,000 nautical miles. Again, that's uh, almost half, more than halfway around the Earth. And even though it's Soviet design, still being used. Small nuclear missiles, Kaliningrad, that's where my academic chair is, in that exclave between Lithuania and Poland. And, as no one knows for sure, uh, creative ambiguity, but they do have Iskander missiles. That we know because it, was, it has been officially mentioned by, the, by Moscow. And these are nuclear cable, but they are tactical. You see, their range is 300 miles, and they would be able to have a tactical weapon up to five, uh, sorry, 50 kilotons. There's anti-aircraft rockets, even, as I mentioned before, which are nuclear. And let's look at some of the weapons that might be used, might be used, in Ukraine, in addition to the big missiles, which are intercontinental, Satan 1 and 2, as mentioned before. This Zippo. Zippo you may have heard of, because it has already been used a few times, probably as a capability demonstration, as a technical demonstration, by the Russians. It is hypersonic, it is launched by the Navy, it brings, it has a speed of Mach 9, as you can see, 1,000 kilometers range, and this, you cannot shoot it down, A, because of its speed, and B, because it's, because of something called plasma stealth. By uh, Mach 9 or 10, what happens is that uh, the, the air uh, around the missile, as it moves so quickly, becomes ionized, and plasma, and this does not register on radars. That's why it's the plasma. Now, this thing, even if you send it empty, it has its kinetic energy of 9 gigajoules, i.e. 2 tons of TNT. It would be able to, if it hits a, an aircraft carrier in the middle, it would be able to cut it in two even without a head uh, wallet inside, simply because of the kinetic energy. Kinzer, that is air launched, Mach 10, nuclear load yield up to 50 kilotons. It was used in March 22 for the first time, again in Ukraine, in order to destroy a, a deep underground, it's one of the bunker busters, a deep underground ammunition. Dump. It has 23 gigajoules, 5.5 tons of kinetic energy, which means that it uses the kinetic energy to actually go several tens of meters into the ground and then, not a nuclear of course in this case, a conventional explosive destroys the depot, but it can be very easily used with a nuclear, it's dual capable. Avant-garde, very interesting. Uh, it's it's carrying, this is what Sarmat, the Satan 2 carries, these, not the combs that we saw before. These are, it's a milk, but more advanced. It's a glide vehicle, which means that it does not follow a ballistic trajectory, which you can, and even first year or first year one part 1A physics can calculate, if you're given the data. It, <coughs> It is maneuverable. It glides and changes direction. It has a ridiculous speed, Mach 27. It carries high yield, much higher than before, up to 2 megatons of 
uh, warheads, the physics package. And of course, even if it was empty, even if it's one of the decoys, it still has 21 tons of TNT kinetic energy. Now, this is probably the scariest of them all, not likely to be used in Ukraine, but with a very tight, tight, at least it has been threatened to be used against Britain. This one. This is the famous Fusayu. Uh, here it is. It's uh, the major designation is Canyon. It is nuclear powered. It is a nuclear torpedo of sorts, but it also has a nuclear reactor that powers it, which essentially means it can go for months around the sea, you know, in the depths, and detect it. It can have 100 kilometers an hour speed underwater. It is stealthy because at a very high speed, a phenomenon called the supercavitation against, again, like we said with the plasma before, stops radars from finding out where it is. Maximum depth, 1,000 meters. So, it can either be used as a loitering munition, so we put it down because there's a nuclear, it doesn't need to be refueled, there's just a nuclear reactor powering it, and it goes around and around the globe, around and around, for months, possibly years, until we use it and we tell it where to go. Or, it can be used, if you don't want to have it loitering, which things may happen, you put a container down into the depth of the sea, perhaps very close to your enemy's shores in international water, that container has a Poseidon inside. And then, if things come to that, you actually give it a signal and it comes out. Now this is... That's scary. That's horribly scary. Yes, you read right. Up to 100 megatons. That would cause a radioactive tsunami that, as this is a real phrase which was used obviously not by a politician but by a very nationalistic and chauvinistic Russian TV presenter, it could plunge Britain into the depths of the, depths of the sea. Not an idle threat. This is really what it could do. It's considered a bit of a doomsday. Not to be used in Ukraine, I'm not saying that. So, we'll close with a few scenarios. You may have read them because I actually published them prior on the description of the lecture. So, if Russia, if it feels that it comes to that, how will it react? First is that they are going to do a test. Neither Russia or the United States have had a nuclear test for the last 20 odd years. They don't need to. They have tested everything, they know it's all working, and if they make new ones, simulations are enough. The technology is all technology for them, everything's fine. Only North Korea has used them. But, exactly because of that reason, a test, even a non weaponized or sub critical test, which of course would be found out by us, the NATO, the other side, we would know that they did the test, would be a very that would be a shot across the bows. Look what we do. And we can do it. Second scenario would be coercion. Real coercion, not threats as in we will bury you or we are going to, you're going to suffer consequences worse than all your history. That would be a clear threat to compel Ukraine or NATO to make any kind of concessions that they want. But that would be clear and unambiguous, not vested in some ambiguity as we have had so far. Of course, we don't know the effectiveness of that because it may provoke a very strong international response and then have even further support for Ukraine. First, we are escalating. That's how it works. First, as we escalate, we demonstrate, there's a demonstration over or just under the Black Sea. Nobody's killed, and if we do it under, the demonstration detonation is creates a tsunami. Nothing big, 
about a one meter. Probably it's not going to cause much damage. Definitely it's not going to kill anyone. But it will be fed and it will show that Russia means business. Of course, this may even happen during negotiations in order to gain further diplomatic leverage. Escalating further, fourth scenario. If Ukraine fears that, let's say Ukraine has been threatened and they realize that the threat is credible, because as I said, it's clear and unambiguous. What happens then? They might well think, well, let's strike first. Obviously, we don't have nuclear weapons, but let's strike, let's send a commando team or some of our missiles, which we have used to strike Russian ships and all that. And it's actually launches a preemptive strike against Russian nuclear facilities or weapons to preempt an attack. Well, on one hand, it would be unlikely that it, this would work and it would succeed. Even if it did, there's a lot of redundancy, as you can imagine, in the Russian nuclear armory. It would probably just make them extremely angry and uh, they, they would hit back in, with nuclear weapons this time. And this might even and in a major war because other countries would be forced to intervene. If Russia is now winning the war, but if in some hypothetical it was losing, then what Russia could do would be strike, a tactical strike, against the Ukraine military using the tactical weapons that we said before. That would be a small one perhaps even using the smallest possible yield, which is 300 tons, 0.3 kilotons. And that, on one hand, it would cripple and do massive damage to a part of the infrastructure. And on the other hand, it would also uh, signify resolve. If things went really bad, Russia could use an electromagnetic pulse. Either that would be on a low altitude over Ukraine, so it would not extend over NATO. Remember, we said the higher up you are, the larger the coverage of your EMP. Or, bad case scenario, and this was, I remember, discussed in March 2022, it would detonate one in the north of Britain, over the North Sea, very high up, and crippled the whole country. Completely. That's the main thing. Final scenarios. A decapitation strike against Zelensky himself in Kiev with a nuclear weapon. So even if you don't know exactly where he is, well, something is going to get him. Eight. That could be an accident. There could be a mistake, a misunderstanding. It has happened before. The, the, in the Cuban missile crisis with the submarine. And this can still happen again. Uh, this can also happen possibly by NATO, but let's say more probably by Russia, because they would be the ones escalating here. Now, as you can imagine, that could be anywhere. It could, if it's, a, if it's an error, a technical error, it could be a rocket that goes off and hits somewhere inside Poland and there's a nuclear explosion. That would risk rapid escalation and potentially a global crisis. Finally, final scenario. A so-called sub-strategic strike which would bring NATO to its knees without hurting the United States intercontinentally. So these strikes would include the British fleet, the forces, the bases in Germany, 
they, the stockpiles of weapons in the Baltic lands, the armed routes that NATO and the US have been sending everything in Poland. So that would be a sort of, I believe that would be the final demonstration, I wouldn't call it a demonstration, the final act, because that would really be risking a global war. We don't know how the US would react, but certainly Europe would be utterly destroyed. Well, not utterly, sorry. They would try to, that's why I said sub-strategic, they would try to make it surgical. But with these weapons, you cannot just hit uh, military targets. So, this brings us to the conclusion of today's seminar. I hope that you enjoyed that, and I look forward to a further discussion and lively Q&A questions. Seven not already been activated through conventional means, and the other part of the question is what are the chances that eight could occur in probabilistic terms, perhaps? So it was the four about eight. Yes. Probabilistic. How, what are the chances of that? Low, but then it can happen. It could get out. But uh, the, it, does this answer the? Number eight or this? Like That's eight. number eight. And number seven, why have they not already done it? Yes, Should well, it would it. not have been done, certainly with a nuclear uh, warhead, but as you very well said, it would be a conventional means. That was because, uh, as we all know, the Russian side had bad, very bad intelligence of how the Ukrainians were going to react. And they, because Kiev is a mother city, it's not an enemy city. Kiev is so important to them, they did not want to, to create, because that would be in central Kiev, which for anyone who has been is one of the most beautiful places in the world. So they did not want to harm a single uh, column or a brick, and that is why. They were expecting that they would just do a decapitation through special forces, send them in, grab Zelensky, and that would be it. Didn't work like that. And after that, it was very late because he was constantly hiding. They didn't do it the very first time. They probably now kick themselves for not having done it. Yes? What do you think uh, are the Can you stand up? What do you think are the main factors on our side which could stimulate... What are side? Who so side are we? Take your pick. Okay. The one sharing this physical land. Let's right. Say. Yes. What do you think uh, is contributing most to actually triggering any one of these scenarios that are proposing? What, uh, if I get it correctly, what is the worst we could do in order to trigger one of these scenarios? Let's go for that. Hey. <laughs> Well, giving, crossing Russia's red line about what help and how much NATO is going to give. I'm not sure I, whether you have heard it, but before I left to come here, I was reading the news about the Russian State of the Union delivered by Putin just today. And he responded, very clearly responded, to what uh, Emmanuel Macron had mentioned yesterday, uh, which was the day before yesterday, in fact, which was, well, perhaps we should consider, we should really consider sending troops into Ukraine. And this, this time, he was very clear. He said that this would precipitate a nuclear war, 
which would be anathema and destructive for the whole of humanity. Go back and read it. So this, that's why of course, Britain, the US, Germany, and Italy and all, and all the others, yesterday came and said, no, no, that's not our plan. We're not going to do it. Because they know that this is a red line that would not happen. Uh, that if we cross, it would happen. Other than that, as we go on now, and with the Russians having the initiative, I believe the, the danger is lower than it was in 22. Especially in the autumn, of, summer and autumn of 22, when uh, the rhetoric here in the West about making Russia lose was at its fiercest, and Russia was indeed losing ground uh, in Ukraine. Because some of these, uh, one or two, for example, or even three, one, two, three, could be if Ukraine had done so well as to threaten Crimea. Then I believe that one would have almost certainly happened, and two, quite probably. About three, maybe yes, maybe. Um, so, so we, we talk a lot about about the West wanting to win constantly, but um, I, I I think from listening to your presentation, I think it's quite I think Russia is quite realistic in that it's now not trying to take Kiev. It's now it's now not trying to take the entirety of the country. It's not going to go into other neighbouring countries. For me, that's quite clear. But my question to you was, what does winning look like to Russia? In this war. Well, as of now, February 24, winning is managing to managing to have and achieve its limited now, more limited than two years ago, targets in Ukraine, while showing to the whole world and to itself that it can withstand the full might of NATO. What's the end game? I was asked about the end game just a few days ago in an interview I gave and I, I, I said, and I will repeat it here, that the end game unfortunately looks like it's going to be almost or very similar to what had been discussed in March 22 and from what we have read, both sides were ready to sign and then they were, the negotiations broke down for some reasons and it's going to look quite similar to that. Not exactly, it will be more pro, possibly more pro-Russian, mm -hmm. but it's not going to be taking over the whole of Ukraine and it's certainly not going to involve Ukraine becoming a member of NATO. If this is, remains on the table, the two red lines are Ukraine for Russia, Ukraine into NATO and Crimea. They could s escalate for any of these two. All the others, we can, they can live with or without. These are the two red lines. Yes. Um, yes, and that is it. Very interesting presentation. So, in your scenarios, you accounted for Ukraine's allies and how they might respond. Where do Russia's allies, especially the nuclear armed allies, fit in your scenario? Russia doesn't technically have nuclear armed allies in the sense that they do not have a, an actual military alliance with either China, which is helping them, but not militarily, <coughs> or with North Korea. Iran is not nuclear, as far as we know. Uh, if you look at this, Russia is quite capable of you know, standing up and eye to eye with NATO. On its own, it doesn't need what looks puny, it's horrible, but purely to us of either China or North Korea or any other country. So that is why I have 
pitted Russia against NATO. NATO, of course, is mostly again the United States, because look, France and Britain have less than China. Yes. So, I, it's a question in which is not to ask. What is the Russian population thinking about all this? If you have an answer. Yes, I do have an answer, and I will, if you allow me, because this might take a bit more, I will take it just in a few minutes. I wanted to have a, some others. Yes. Um, I was just interested, uh, Dimitri, thank you very much, a very interesting talk. Um, uh, Macron and um, what has just occurred over the last couple of days, I'm interested in the blurring of the red line for Russia, because um, if one is to believe uh, what is already going on. There are forces there on the ground from NATO countries at this point in time. So, uh, indeed, we've got some special forces there. We've got um, forces there helping them launch some of our conventional weapons that um, we, have, uh, we have supplied them. And so, and so there is reality in this rhetoric, and there is a blurring of those lines. And I just wanted to understand what you believe the reality of given that scenario that we've got? Well, for the, the special forces, first of all, it is without any doubt that the Russians are and have been aware of this. There's no way that... First, they have a very... They have now, by now, they have a better network of informants within Ukraine. Number two, they can think that you know, these missiles are extremely complicated systems. And you don't just need to make them go, you want them to go, to go and hit something extremely specific. So they understand that there will be some weapons experts there and some special forces to protect both the missiles and the weapon experts. Hence Germans, well, Germans probably not, but British, Americans, and possibly French, and what like that. So the Russians know it. And it's a situation that this doesn't fit because it is a, a situation that they come to us and say, I know that you have them. You know that I know that you have them. You know that I know that I know that you know that I have them. But we're, let's pretend it never happened. So they don't want to use this as a red line because it would be so very easy to deny from our side. That's why I do not think that the existence of these technical experts would make much difference to Russia's red lines. What did make, and we heard already the results, is sending combat troops or airplanes or having a, an ex air ex flight exclusion zone, things like that. Does this answer the question? It does Thank you. Yes. Thank you for Basically, how much power does law, international law, hold in protecting nuclear threats? If it does any. Close to none. Unfortunately. Yeah, because as you can see, even with conventional threats, everyone, I believe, agrees that Russians, that Russia's attack against Ukraine was illegal and immoral. Did it stop them? No. So, all the more so that a nuclear armed state would be very circumspect in using a nuclear weapon for very obvious reasons. They can backfire on you, amongst other things. So, it would be, this would be at a crisis moment where the last thing, the, the whole situation, the whole paradigm would have broken out at such a level that the least of your worries would be what international law would think about it. Yes. Uh, thanks so much so far for your presentation. I think I would actually have two questions. The first one would be, to what extent would you think the war in Ukraine might already be like some sort of lost cause because it's a non-nuclear state fighting a nuclear one and it could well be that Right now, just like sending in some troops and keeping it going, but ultimately, if 
Russia wants, they would just have to deploy tactical nuclear weapons. And if they don't want, if the West doesn't want a full-on nuclear war with Russia, then they would have to accept it this way. And the second question of mine would be, what extent do you think um, the Western population, or maybe the West as a bloc, is more susceptible to like those nuclear threats because politicians are like affected by how the electorate perceives those threats, whereas in Russia there's more than an autocracy where whether or not the population is afraid of those doesn't really influence the decision makers. Okay, let's take the first one. Strategically, and as things stand now, the tide has turned against Ukraine. There are some analysts who predict that this will go on uh, as, in a kind of frozen way, trench warfare for another year or two. I read some analysis that were saying that we may, have, we may reach a point of sudden collapse of Ukraine. So within a week, everything would be over. This may happen or may not. In reality, and to use strategic terms now, Russia has what we call, in strategic studies, escalation dominance. That means that they can decide how far up or how low to escalate. It's, a, it's up to them. It's not up to us. Whatever we can do, because they are there, they are neighbors, and they have all these that we saw, they have complete escalation dominance. So they can choose how far to pull. That means that in, for a very cold-minded observer, Ukraine has lost or is going to lose. There's no way that it can win. Russia can escalate all the way to global nuclear war about Ukraine. Whether it will or whether it should is not something that is immediately related to the strategic aspect of it, but it can. So that is why the best thing would probably be negotiations even now. And the Ukrainians have fought so marvelously, so unexpectedly valiantly that not only we should applaud, but even the, I assure you, the Russians themselves are giving kudos to their opponents for fighting like that. So I believe that even though we're going to end up in a situation similar to what it was March 22, it's, Ukraine would unfortunately not be able to sustain. Remind me, second question? It was the threat of a nuclear war and the electricity. Oh yes. Russians in general, not that they are happy to use nuclear weapons. I'm talking about the population now. Not at all. Not that they are not afraid of them. Not at all. Not that they don't know what will happen if global nuclear war happens. However, within these uh, pillars, which are our strongest here, there are the following very small differences. First of all, by definition, Russia is in a better position to survive either a limited or a total nuclear war than anyone else, simply because it is so vast and because it also has very dispersed forces hiding in forests in mobile ICBMs, and also because, at least in smaller towns, uh, they had, until recently, every two or three years, they have a drill whereby they evacuate the whole town. Which they would, be, and that's a nuclear drill. Everyone goes out and sleeps in tents. Well, everyone, as in not the people who are geriatric or in hospitals, but everyone able bodied from a 200 something like Cambridge goes out. And that's a drill, and it happens. So they are more used to us. Plus, as you say, the, there is no electoral cycle for them. So it is in these marginal, I should say, points, the Russians are more ready for escalation than we would be in the West. Yes, uh, sorry. Well, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, 
I'm thinking about something unthinkable. Thanks for that. In, uh, I'm so sorry. Can you stand up? I'm thinking about something unthinkable, but thanks for your insight. Um, I want to ask two questions. First, um, I'm thinking about history of the uh, Soviet Union once the collapse. Uh, can you tell us more about the security and how to secure the control of nuclear uh, stockpile and arsenal when the states failed? Because it may happen in North Korea, also if, in case Russia self exposed I hope it will happen. Uh, unfortunately, it won't really. And the second one is um, the Russian nuclear strategy on China. Because recently I just saw, I think yesterday, they published a secret document, that, the document saying that Russia prepared uh, exercise during the 2008 and 2014. What's your view on Russian nuclear strategy against China? So, again, what, what happened? They prepared what kind of exercise? Uh, it's called Far East Exercise. Yeah, yeah. But what happened with that? Uh, they prepared use of tactical nuclear weapons if, in, in case China and faith. Russia Far East. Oh yes, this this is <laughs> that's that is why many analysts have said that uh, bad geopolitical uh, approach has thrown has pushed Russia into the arms of China because the China is a natural geopolitical enemy of Russia, and of course this uh, even in during the time of unlimited friendship, they, as every military should do, they are also wargaming a possibility and option of attacking China. But don't worry, I assure you that in the Ministry of Defense there are secret plans of uh, His Majesty's government attacking both France and the Republic of Ireland. And this is what they do. What was the first question? Uh, the first question is how to secure the nuclear arsenal if the, a state failed? Well, as we saw, it was quite secure even 30 years ago, and now the technology is much better because the Ukrainians who had it, as I said, they could use it as paperweights only. And if they tried to tamper, it would be even more useless. So, what we are worried about is really dirty bombs, and plutonium happens to be a very potent poison as well. But it's not an existential threat, and it's, of course, what we are doing is making it as difficult as possible for them to fall into the wrong hands. If they do fall into the wrong hands, the worst case scenario is one or several dirty bombs that will contaminate vast very big part of the planets, but as I said, it's not going to be nuclear war. No, sorry? Yes? You have a question. Yes? Behind? No. Who else? Yes. I can't hear you, please. Thank you. Do you know much about how the data on the number of warheads in different countries is collected? Oh. So that's specific. Yes, yes. Uh, I have, being a good academic, I have not cut away the references, so I will not be accused of any uh, inappropriate academic. So here it is. This is from the BBC, but the Scientific Sources, Federation of American Scientists. Note, it says, top line, all figures are estimates. So, they're, they're quite serious, the Federation, and objective. So, this is from the Federation of American Scientists. Uh, I will take one more question and then I will answer your question as I promised, and that would be also. Awesome. Who has not asked so far? Who has not? Yes. Um, what are the current estimates of the death tolls in the world for the nuclear war between the US and Russia? I remember during the during the Cold War, it was estimated as 250 million immediate deaths and three billion 
three and a half to four billion deaths within the next two years, primarily of hunger, and total collapse after that, um, existential risk collapse. Admittedly, I have not found in the sources any calculation more recent than the Cold War, because until two years ago, no one expected that this might be the case. I think that we should revisit that. And finally, could you repeat for the benefits of the audience the last question, please, very quickly. So, what does the Russian population really think about all this? About the Ukraine war. I will say you things briefly and then, and then we, can, we will continue over a glass of wine. They are now at a stage of a grudging acceptance. In general, the majority, the best one sentence response was given to me by a member, a former member of the armed forces of Russia. And he said, it was a mistake, but we had no other choice. That's, whatever else I say, it will come back to that. They feel that their hands were forced, their hand was forced, and now we have, even though at the beginning there was more reaction, now they're in the point of grudging acceptance. But really this, it was a mistake, but we had no other choice, is what 90% of the population would say. I would like to ask everyone, actually you should say that. Oh, well, firstly, um, can we get just a hand for such a <laughs> I, I do this for a living and I still learn a lot from this presentation, so thank you so much. Um, we would like to continue this conversation over some wine, so yeah, and some food as well. Amazing. So please come join us for uh, a nice wine reception, and thank you again for coming. Thank we you. Really very appreciate much. having thank you. you.